we are going on an adventure with Red Hat. Red Hat? <laughs> okay, so you've probably heard of Kubernetes and you've probably heard of Docker, but have you heard of OpenShift from Red Hat? I've been using it a lot the last few months, ever since uh, AMD sent me a boatload of Epic CPUs. You may have seen the posts on the Level 1 forum or hints in some of our other videos or maybe some stuff on the Linux channel. But we're going to do some stuff with Red Hat OpenShift. But before we get to that, I wanted to sort of share with you what I've done with one of our experimental chariots with which to get you there, because you could learn a lot for how you could approach your own home lab, build a really nice kick-ass system with modern hardware for not a lot of money. Let's take a look. All right, so this is a 2U server chassis. This is two rack units. You shouldn't be afraid of picking up rack unit stuff, especially older stuff, for your home lab, or even just for an experiment. Sometimes you wanna buy this as a small business just to run the experiment, to show your boss, like, yeah, when we do this for real, it's gonna cost less than the cloud, or it's gonna be better in some other way, or, you know, something like that. So this is our chariot with which we are starting. This is originally an Epic Naples platform, but I've upgraded it to Epic Milan. I did have to swap the motherboard, and that meant that I had to get creative a little bit with the rear I.O. on this chassis. Fortunately, the rear I.O. on this chassis screws in, kind of like ATX, but it's not quite a standard. So I was able to modify the rear I.O. to accommodate this motherboard. Similarly, with the front, you know, it was designed for SATA storage. 24 SATA bays, Naples, nice low-cost economical storage platform. Well, because I'm wanting to support some legacy projects, I've made the first eight connections here SAS, Serial Attached SCSI. You run into that a lot of the time with legacy projects. The big difference, well, there's a lot of differences between SATA and SAS. They're different electrical characteristics. SAS is compatible, uh, SATA is compatible with SAS interfaces, but you can't use SAS drives on a SATA interface. The other thing that SAS drives gives you is dual pathing which means that you have two paths to each drives optionally. The way that I've got it set up in this chassis, I don't have a redundant path, but it is possible to do that. It's like basically the difference between a smart backplane and a smart pair of controllers and a dumb backplane and a dumb pair of controllers. But again, for a legacy project or a conversion and not something that requires five nines of uptime, this is completely fine. It used to be in the olden days that you wanted redundant everything because you would try to make a system like this not fail. Redundant power supplies, redundant serial attached SCSI controllers, a backplane that also had redundant components so that if any one electrical component or a wire or a connector or something failed, that there would be a redundant path for retrieving your data. Those days are pretty much behind us. The way that, that redundancy is now approached is with clusters, where you have clusters of servers. You have three or four or five or six or seven physical boxes that act as one logical box on the network. They share data, they shuttle data around. Um, historically, this wasn't done because it was too much overhead to move data between boxes. It was too expensive. But now we're basically to a point where you can connect up a whole bunch of computers by glorified PCI Express interfaces. So the you know short run bandwidth between systems really isn't that big of a deal. Anyway, eBay is flooded with older hardware right now. You can get you know Xeon V3, V4 stuff. It's really pretty crazy. Don't do it. Don't do it. I love older gear just as much as the next person, but some of the value proposition for older AMD Epic processors blows the doors off of older hardware. Let me explain. So if you look at the cost per unit compute, uh, some of the Epic platform motherboards are even cheaper than gaming motherboards. We've got the ROG Zenith 2 Extreme Alpha. That's over a thousand dollar motherboard. The motherboard in here, the MZ32AR0 from Gigabyte to host Epic CPUs is like $500 pandemic notwithstanding. That is a way different price proposition than what you would get otherwise. And you don't have to put it in a rack chassis, you could put it in a nice tower chassis. You can check out the Fractal Torrent chassis. We've got the dual socket. Uh, it's, the, uh, it's the HB0 dual socket motherboard from Gigabyte that has two Epic Milan CPUs. Now those CPUs, you're not gonna get those on eBay for practically nothing. But you could get Naples or Rome CPUs on eBay for a pretty good savings. AMD also offers what they call P-series CPUs. So if you look, 
This is a single socket server. Single socket means that you can opt to buy a lesser expensive CPU. AMD gives you a huge price discount if you pick up a CPU that only works in single socket motherboards. That's what those P-series CPUs are. The 32 core P-series CPU is about two grand. That is the sweet spot. That is an incredible deal. You've got easily supportable two terabytes of memory, but I haven't done that. I've got uh, 16 gigabytes of memory in this platform. This is actually older, inexpensive DDR4, so it's not running at the full 3200, but hey, you know, this is a relatively low cost platform. So you can pick up a chassis like this on eBay for around five or $600 with a motherboard that supports Naples CPUs. You could get some, some of the really high clocked Naples CPUs and run that in your platform. That's completely fine. You know, DDR4 2666 memory. And you know, you've got a really incredible home lab setup that'll do basically anything you need to. The same goes for other brands like Supermicro or Gigabyte or Dell. Just a warning though, if you are gonna go the AMD route, if you go HP or Lenovo or um, Dell, when you put in a retail processor in one of those motherboards, it will marry to that OEM brand. So if you pick up a 7343 retail CPU from Newegg for about two grand and you use that CPU in a Dell chassis, that CPU will never work again in any chassis but Dell. This is something that, that Dell requires as an OEM in order to buy product. But if you pick up Gigabyte or Supermicro, you're not gonna have that problem. So I really like Gigabyte for this platform because these are much closer to ATX standards. Uh, everything is removable. The power supplies are FSP group, so those are pretty standard. The, the, the chassis in general have been super, super upgradable, super flexible. So I am way off the reservation here with all the mods to this chassis, but this is gonna be the perfect Red Hat OpenShift platform. I don't know what you might be thinking, but, but I wanna use some of the drives for U.2 or I need more M.2 slots. Well, there are things like this adapter. This goes, into a by eight slot, but it requires that the slot is configurable for by four, by four bifurcation in the BIOS. And then you've got two U.2 connections. And these adapters, depending on which kind of adapter you get, could be good for up to PCI Express 4. And that's not something that is easily obtainable right now with M.2 to U.2 breakout cables. PCI Express 4 compatibility in anything other than a printed circuit board is really hard to do right now. This one is a little tall. It sits a little above the top of the chassis, so this doesn't quite fit into you unless you have a horizontal slot adapter. And again, I've got plenty of clearance because of this particular chassis. This is awesome. This chassis was designed for GPUs or something like that. So it has a 1U heatsink for the CPU. Of course, that's gonna limit the thermal design power of our CPU. We're not gonna be able to use 280 watt Epic CPUs in this chassis. If you find an older Milan or a Naples, you know, there's going to be like 240 watts or whatever. It's not going to work here. Milan juices it up to 280 watts. So, you know, just be careful about that with your airflow and that kind of thing. The fans in this, these are not what I would call hot swap, but they are standard. They're San Ace fans. So these are, are imminently replaceable. They're easy to get. There's not really any danger of, oh, it's a proprietary fan. There's not anything that's going to work. This is just wired in. The connectors here are not uh, non-standard. M.2 kind of works the same way. You can get adapters like this. This is a carrier card that'll hold four M.2 on a PCI Express by 16 card. And this one is half height compatible. So I can install this in an expansion slot like that. And I still have plenty of clearance to put the top of the case back on and everything is good. So Gigabyte here, again, does some really awesome stuff. The normal PCI layout that you would have on an ATX motherboard lines up with how they mount them on this particular chassis. So this is really a lot of flexibility. I love that. So for our Red Hat OpenShift platform, we've got a serial attached SCSI controller with four SAS two terabyte hard drives. Plus I've got two two terabyte M.2s that are on board on our Gigabyte motherboard. And then I've got four more M.2 on a single X16 add-in card. So I can rock you know, over 10 terabytes of flash storage in this thing even before I started to use any of my two and a half inch SATA bays. Now the first eight are connected to my SAS controller. The next eight are connected to onboard SATA on the motherboard. And then the last eight slots are completely empty. This backplane does have connections for NVMe, but they're not compatible. It might be set up for U.3 or it might've been experiments or I might not know the jumper settings, but it doesn't seem like I can use the last eight slots on this backplane for anything but SATA. So you run into that sometimes when it's like, oh, I'm gonna modify this. And it's like, well, not so fast. It might not be quite that easy. But still, for a home server setup, 
the power supplies cost more than the chassis and the motherboard and, and everything else, especially when you get a P-series CPU. Now with this system and a couple more like it, we can talk about clustering. You may have seen some of our other videos on clustering. We're gonna dive in a little deeper on all that stuff. But with clustering, we treat our servers a little bit more like cattle than pets. So the particulars of the software setup of this are going to be unremarkable. We're going to basically automate the software setup end of this so that it can par participate in an open shift cluster. The idea for future cloud providers is gonna be that you have some on-prem hardware or some hardware at the edge that you own and control, and that's gonna do some of your heavy lifting. But when your software people are deploying for local development and local testing versus in the cloud, it's the same process. When you deploy, it will deploy to physical machines that are on-prem, and then production might be cloud machines that are out in the cloud. Or you might deploy to an, an S3 bucket. Really, it's just S3 compatible storage on this, and then this machine transparently is going to replicate that storage to the cloud so that it's available locally. These are really incredible skills to have for your career and your administration and things like that, whether you're a developer or into DevOps or anything like that. This is the platform that you can begin to learn those skills. And actually, it doesn't even have to be this. You could run Red Hat OpenShift on something like the, you know, the ASRock X300 Desk Mini, one of those eight cores, 32 gigabytes of memory. You can do that on there. You can have uh, RAID 1 for storage and, the weakest link with that is really the networking. Whereas with this, I've got my OCP2 slot, and I can add 10 or 25 gig ethernet, plus I got a ton of PCI Express 4 slots down the end here, so I can add whatever connections I want. Maybe I can get this hooked up with our Dell 100 gigabit switch, our S5212 uh, F-ON 100 gigabit switch. That's open too. Open networking is a whole thing. The ONI, the open network efficient, you know, it's just, it's a whole other conversation. I'm one of this level one, this has been a quick look at the mad science between, you know, for modding the thing. This is really just kind of a vlog for some of our patrons and supporters. Like, hey, what are you up to? It's like, well, I've been working on this. I've run a bunch of different operating systems on this. And for a little while, we're gonna run Red Hat on this. You can get Red Hat for free for up to 16 servers. Did you know that? So when they did away with the uh, CentOS thing, they looked at that and they said, you know, we're kind of losing ground here to uh, Kubernetes and Google Compute Cloud and Docker and all of the other technologies. Let's give people Red Hat Enterprise for free. And I gotta say, I really like Podman and Cockpit as an interface to let you sort of web manage your server so that it's more like cattle and less like a pet. I really do like the structure and the, the organizational philosophy that Red Hat is going for, which surprises me a little bit given past history and things like that. Red Hat seems like they're actually catching up and doing some really cool stuff with bleeding edge technology. We're gonna have more videos on that in the future, don't you worry. We're simulating uh, three data centers, I think it's three, three, three data centers with like 40 terabytes of NVMe flash, maxing out our 75 F3 Epic systems. We've also got a dual 40 core Xeon Platinum 8380 that really, really holds its own. It's actually a really solid platform for this kind of thing as well. So stay tuned for that video on Wonderless is Level One. I'm signing out and you can find me in the Level One forums. Or if you work on this stuff and you wanna share some stuff, let's you know, chat on the forum. Love to hear from you. All right, I'm signing out and I'll see you there.